One of my earliest adventures into building is this chimney stack that's on the roof here that I built when I was about 17 years old. It's actually where I used to live on my mum and dad's house, you know. We had a chimney stack with about four pots on and of course there were only one of them used for the water system, you know, the back boiler and the uh, hot water in the taps. The other three sort of let water run down the walls in the bedrooms of next door and, and in our bedrooms on our side. So I decided that I would take it down and build a nice chimney stack. And it didn't really have any design, I had no drawings, you know, I, I just kept altering it in shape and size as it went up. And it, this is about 40 odd years ago, maybe more than that. And the people who live there now wanted to actually dismantle it and take it down, but the council put a preservation order on it. <laughs> and the thing still looks nearly as good as the day that I built it. I'm quite proud of it, really. Really, ever since I was a little lad, you know, I've been interested in buildings and, and building techniques and all the skills that, that went into building a house, you know. I mean, even way back into the Middle Ages, you know, all the different tools and the different joints, and the different ways they had of sticking things together, you know, soldering lead and all sorts of exciting things. Item Mort is one of the oldest and loveliest medieval manor houses in all of England. It stood here for 650 years, almost unchanged. The moat surrounds all four wings of the house and all of the walls drop straight down into its waters. Within these four wings, there's a lovely open courtyard. And when you first look at it, the house looks as though it was all built at the same time. But it's actually the product of six centuries of development. Peter Leach is an architect and archaeologist who has been responsible for much of the conservation work here. I, I think standing in the courtyard, it does demonstrate how item moat as a house has just developed over the years, and people adding bits to it from time to time, and always obviously loving the house. What makes item moat very interesting at the moment is the restoration work that's being done here. gives a very good opportunity to find out how a medieval house was built and to look at the materials that were used in its construction. Well, this is the roof of the Great Hall, Fred. Yeah. And you can see the, the stone rubble end mm. wall here. On top of it, there are the, the tops of rafters yeah. and the larthing. Yeah. And then, of course, on that top of that are the, 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 the tiles, peg mm -hmm. tiles. Yeah. They're not nailed. But they, they have holes in which you put wooden, wooden pegs. Yeah. And there's also quite a lot of store in that. Mm. And I'm wondering if that was put in you know, for some kind of insulation, mm. uh, for, for heat mm. insulation. Put in for the, for the, for the new tiling. Yeah. Well, they can keep the original timbers, they are doing. But down in this valley, the great beam was so rotten that they are having to put a brand new one in. This, Fred, is the the roof plate or beam mm. that was under the valley gutter mm. when we yeah. saw it up on the roof. Yeah, it must have leaked a bit. <laughs> they didn't keep the mm. gutters clear, of course. Mm. That's mm. why it's rotted so badly. But this yeah. timber only dates from 1605 mm. or 1610. Yeah, it's amazing, really, because you think of an oak tree as being mm. like the centre being fairly hard and the sapwood oh, yes. being the softest, mm. don't you? And, oh, yes. and yet the, the mm. outer edges of it have survived oh, yes. pretty well, haven't yes, they? Yes, yes. Uh, mm. A house like this has stood up to the elements for centuries. So how did they manage to build things that lasted for so long? The materials they used must have been pretty good. And until they had all the things that modern builders have, they had to use whatever materials were to hand. Sometimes crude, but effective. I want me to go in the camel. That's right. Yeah. 
No, it's what approximately right, half of that half full of, of, full yeah. of um, mm. that is the sifted cow dung. Yes, yeah, it's, it's nice stuff, dung. is it? That's it. Mm. Yes. Yeah. You can tell. Yeah. Yeah. A nice measure. Yeah. Oh, bloody heart's rich, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I was collecting this seven o'clock this morning. Yeah, so it's fresh. With our local yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, dairy yeah, herd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I'll tell you what, it takes a bit of mixing, doesn't it? Yeah, it's not, it, it, uh, it, it isn't sort of easy to shove about. Well, that's been milled beforehand with, yeah. with the hair uh, yeah. put in. What's the idea of the, uh, the cow dung like? Right, well, it, it does give it more uh, elasticity, you know, with yeah, the, uh, yeah, yeah. when you're spreading it. It also hardens. I would say he's done that before myself. No, I mixed a bit of mortar in my <laughs> yeah. Never with any cow muck in it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> can't wait to smear that on the wall. <laughs> yeah. Nice bit of stuff. It's a nice colour, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a uh, lion hair, yeah. Yeah. goat hair. Yeah. With um, sharp sand. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you try yourself and. See how you get it with that. <laughs> I'll have a go. Have a go. <laughs> right. You want me to continue in a downward yeah, direction? Yeah, that'd be nice. Uh-uh. <laughs> oh, bloody hell. <laughs> Let me put less on the hook, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Push it well in, because it has to go through the, yeah. the larve to key. Yeah. That's all right. A lot more. Yeah. Careful like that. But that's all right, come on. Now that's going to be there 800 years. Yeah. So uh, it's good to think that we do something that's going to stand a test of time, doesn't it? Yeah, I think Any, that's enough for me. That's great. Any time you want a job with me. Yeah, yeah it does have a tendency to stick to the floor, doesn't it? Like the proverbial wants it to the blanket. Well, that's it? right. We keep it damp, in fact. We mm. spray it yeah. to keep mm. it damp so it doesn't dry too quickly. Yeah, yeah. Because it will craze. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm. So, and that's why yeah. we key as well, because, uh, you know, mm. that helps to stop the mm. shrinkage. Definitely has the smell of the countryside. That's though, right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh. Lath and plaster was fine for the house of a country squire in rural Kent, but I'm on my way now to see a palace that was built to entertain a king. Hampton Court had to be built of something that looked more substantial, but again it came down to the availability of local materials. So Hampton Court was built of brick. Hyde Malt is quite a modest place, but at the other end of the scale, Hampton Court is the biggest and most splendid Tudor palace in all of England. The palace was begun in 1515 by Henry VIII's chief minister, Cardinal Wolsey. And this central gateway is part of his original palace. It's a bit strange how history goes, you see, because Henry gave his best minister, Cardinal Wolsey, permission to do some lodgings for him and build himself an house, but because he couldn't fix it up with the Pope about his divorce, he kicked him out and carried on building himself. And of course, that's what you can see over there today, or most of it. Yeah, so Jonathan Foyle is the assistant curator for historic buildings, and he knows all about how it was built. Well, anyway, Jonathan, right, tell right. me, which is the bit that Cardinal Wolsey did? Yeah. Well, he, he took it over in 1514 when he wasn't yet a cardinal. Yeah, and sorry uh, about that. I've never no, been very good on this trip. No, don't worry, because he's on the cusp of that, on that, of that career. Yeah. But he um, took over a medieval manor house of the Knights mm -hmm. Hospitallers, and some parts are buried away in there. Mm -hmm. But what we see now is the best surviving example of Wolsey's domestic mm -hmm. architecture, at least. And so he, translate, he transformed this into a bishop's palace, yeah. and um, one suitable then on for a cardinal as he mm -hmm. developed it yeah. gradually, and one suitable for accommodating yeah. the royal family. So the whole of this breadth between the um, two gables to either side of the gatehouse yeah. is his. And then the other bits, Henry's, is it? He, They're additions by Henry. When, when he yeah. fell out with him. Even before Wolsey fell, Henry took the house over. Mm. He couldn't wait to get him. These rooms are Wolsey's. 
Fred, mm -hmm. probably built in the late 1520s when he needed to, to retire away from the king and queen. He got himself in deep water by that stage. <laughs> and um, so from here, he could look to the hall in that direction and yeah. the gardens in that direction. And he may well have warmed his hands at this fire because yeah. that's an original feature. Yeah, the ceiling's quite interesting, isn't it? It, it is, it, yeah. It, it, like, I know the background's plaster, but the, the, the ornamental bit, you know, is a bit different. What's that made of? It is. Well, they're, they're all moulded timber ribs, mm -hmm. and each one's got a groove running the length of it, mm -hmm. in which is slipped a length of um, leather mache. Mm. So that's wet, pounded, stamped yeah. leather, mm. which is gilded mm. in the fashionable style of the day with arabesques, mm. and then um, gilded lead leaves yeah the pin bosses on the top of the junction yeah yeah, yeah. Um, lots of lovely old panelling yes there is this is quite plain as panelling yeah, is, is of course yeah. you, what you'd expect in the 16th century is much mm. more of the linen fold mm. uh, yeah. pattern stuff that was like that it is and, and we've got quite a lot yeah. through here just in the next room so we've got two rooms here fred that are Covered yeah. in, uh, in linen fold. Um, I rather like this one with the cross design in there. It makes me yeah, it's think it made a produce quite, the walls. Quite uh, ornate, that really, isn't it? It is. Linen yeah. fold panelling. <laughs> like, really, the reason it's called linen fold panelling is because it, it represents folded up linen, you know, in a way, or cloth, you know, all, like your grandma did, you know, all wrapped up nicely. You're a man who works with your hands. Oh Fred. yeah, yeah. How would you go about making something like that? The timber in between all the folds of the would be done with like concave and convex moulding planes and sort of small grooving planes. So you, so you just groove the whole length yeah, and that's done yeah, in the Yeah, yeah, and like the latest that looks to me as though it could have been done same as masonry with an hammer and chisel, you know, because yeah. it's all a bit, bit up and downish. Right. But that, that's the sort of effect to, to get it to look like folded up material. Uh, I, I failed woodwork badly at school, so oh, full I'll, of admiration I'll, I'll for anybody who can do class, that. Actually, <laughs> but you yeah. <laughs> well, th this is Henry VIII's bit, is it? Well, this hall was rebuilt by Henry VIII on the site of Wolsey's. I'm yeah. researching that at the moment, and it mm -hmm. seems almost certain that Wolsey's hall was actually longer, bigger by area. Yeah. So Henry rebuilt this from 1532 to 5, yeah. a yeah. few years after he'd taken the palace over. Yeah, this wonderful hammer beam roof that's up above our heads here, you know. I, I always thought, you know, really, that it all came about because they couldn't get big trees, you know, but there's a little bit more to it than that, isn't there, really? There is. Well, I'm, I'm sure basically that's right, that you're limited by the length of trunk that, mm. a, that a tree yeah, can provide for yeah. a beam. And if you imagine spanning 40 feet like this, mm. you'd need mm. a beam of, you know, immense yeah. oh, depth yeah. well, if, you, if you could I've find I've seen it. that myself in industrial premises in Lancashire, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to get across here it would be maybe two feet deep right. by nine inches thick I with, with a right. queen post and two vertical uh, posts yeah. and heavily braced up with iron rods to yeah. accomplish the same thing. And if you, if you imagine the, the, the feeling of lightness and space you want to get within this hall, if you have beams yeah. coming across mm. you've spoilt it mm. uh, um, already I think. Mm. And Westminster Hall in the 1390s they pioneered this technique mm -hmm. of using a hammer beam and and um, building it straight out from the wall, like mm, a cantilever. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So that can support then another a vault, arch, like, yeah, you know, just yeah. over the mm. central section of the roof. Yeah, and so it's a very yeah. light mm. uh, construction. Looks yeah. like the underside of a ship, mm. perhaps. And this is one of the latest, because Westminster mm. was 1390s. Mm -hmm. This is 1530s. I think it's Henry VIII's best piece of building <coughs> here, certainly. Mm. In the Middle Ages, the roof construction, like hammer beam roofs and crook beam constructions, the main joint really in all of it were the mortise and tenon joint, which is basically an hole in one block of wood and a bit sawn on the end of the other that fits in the hole. And the tools needed to form such a joint are fairly simple. And, and even today, they're all, they must have been very similar in the Middle Ages, like a great big drill for drilling a series of holes in a straight line. And then, of course, a chisel and a hammer for joining all the round holes up into a rectangular shape one. So we'll, we'll fix it together and see if it fits. This is an orange mortise and tenon joint on a grand scale. That goes in there like that. And then we've got the, this beam. The hole is slightly out of line, so now, when I knock this wooden peg in here, it'll have the effect of pulling the tenon down into the into the mortise hole. 
And of course, once we have knocked it in, we won't be able to get it out. So here goes. That feels very good and very tight. Now the next stage is to bash in the wooden wedges when I can find them. Uh, here they are. Uh, one in there like that, and one in there like that. Uh, um, you know. Yeah. Now, there's a mortise and tenon joint on a grand scale, and that's how all the great roof trusses in Hampton Court would have been made. They did chop all that off after, you know, make it level. Nevertheless, it's so, you know, that's what they did do. Buildings never stayed the same. They changed as different owners extended them, added to them, or converted them. Hampton Court remained much as it was in Henry's day until William III came to the throne in 1689. William then commissioned Sir Christopher Wren to rebuild it, and it was Wren who added this Baroque palace. Hampton Court was always a place to live, but some great houses didn't start off as houses at all. I went down to Laycock in Wiltshire to see one that's best known today as the home of a famous 19th century inventor. William Henry Fox Talbot was a great 19th century innovator who, of course, really were responsible for finding out more or less all we know today about photography. His family home, like a lot of big country houses, you know, started life off as a religious institution. Before the Reformation, this was a nunnery. Then after Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries, he sold it to a courtier named William Sherrington. A lot of courtiers and nobles like Sherrington bought monastic buildings that Henry had taken over, and the king made quite a lot of money out of it. When he bought this place, it consisted of a church and many large rooms that were cold and drafty that the nuns lived in. And at the time of the Reformation, when Henry was selling all these places to his noblemen and what have you, the great problem they had were making them so you could live in the places, you see. I mean, there were no central eating then. Things were a bit rough. I mean, in the wall nunnery, there were only one fireplace in a room called the warming room, which is next door, I believe. The answer for most of the people who purchased these places were to flatten the wall lot and use the material to build, you know, a new house with. Well, it's, you know, easier than digging it out of a quarry. The thing is, Sherrington, he didn't, he, he, he left most of it and sort of built on top of it, as you might say. I mean, read that was a wonderful thing when he did that because it preserved all these lovely arches and windows and niches and nice things. You know. This is what's known as the South Gallery, and of course the whole house is full of long, narrow passages which follow the line of the cloisters underneath and the bits with the groin roofs. All the lots like stuck on top of these passageways. In the days of the nuns, you know, the, 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 ab the abbess was billeted down that end in her private quarters, and the nuns were up this end in the dormitory, and they were just a passageway then, you know, they just, you know, toed and froed in it. And basically the same when Sherrington lived here, but it had a tile floor. And then when Fox Talbot came, he put both floorboards down and made these beautiful bay windows, and that bay window there is the very one were well, the first photograph were taken. This was in 1835 when the Industrial Revolution and British inventiveness was at its height. From Laycock, I went all the way up to Northumberland to see a house that was built by one of Victorian Britain's mightiest industrialists. The Industrial Revolution brought a great surge in house building and the rich industrialist built wonderful mansions like this. This is Cragside in Northumberland, the home of the first Lord Armstrong, innovator, inventor, engineer and gun maker. In the 19th century, he played a major role in the industrialisation of Tyneside, and his Ellswick works at Newcastle was the art of a heavy engineering industrial empire. 
which manufactured cranes, hydraulic machinery and armaments. Built on a burr and rugged hillside, it was one of the most remarkable houses of its day. It had hot and cold running water, telephones, a fire alarm, an hydraulic lift, um, and, and the most magnificent thing, it would, all the electricity was generated by an hydroelectric power station. No wonder they called it the Palace of the Modern Magician. As well as building the house, Armstrong created a series of lakes in the grounds. He used these to store the water that provided the power to generate electricity and drive all the hydraulic machinery he installed in the house. Lord Armstrong did all he could to help his domestic staff with his hydraulic machinery. He had a lift for taking up the coal to the bedrooms, an hydraulic lift. And of course, this wonderful spit here is driven by a water turbine that's quite a way off down in the cellar. And it works the complicated system of rods and bevel gears and universal joints. You know, you can actually move it away from the fire and move it into the fire. And of course, it goes round, as you can see here, uh, some barbecue without, believe me. And then the biggest bike boiler I've ever seen, of course, for the domestic hot water. This is the dining room where he entertained such guests as the King of Siam and the Shah of Persia, who of course came here for arms dealing, you know, buy guns off him. As well as using his hydraulic machinery to help with the domestic chores, he, he also used it to impress prospective customers. I mean, the whole place really were a shop window for the inventions that, you know, he, he, he did. This, without a doubt, must be one of the finest Victorian domestic interiors in England. I mean, the ceiling alone, of course, there's a few good English oak trees gone into it. The fireplace is a wonderful creation. You know, it's got to be the biggest ingle nook fireplace in England. The outer arch, Gothic arch, and the great stones going up have survived very well, but I think Sir William did a bit of overstoking because there's a few nasty cracks in his uh, mantelpiece proper. You can imagine him sat there on a cold and frosty night uh, thinking of what he was going to do next with his hydraulics. This is the library, the, the other great Victorian room in the house. Sir William actually used it every day, you know, as his sitting room in a way. I mean, you can see he did a bit of letter writing over there. The other interesting things are the lamps on the shelves. They originally, they were oil lamps, and of course, Sir William had them converted to electricity, which came from a generator outside down in the grounds. Apparently, Sir William's first attempt at electric lighting was quite an interesting thing. He actually had a, a, a vessel full of mercury, and you lowered the bit with the bulb on into the mercury by hand, you know, because there were no light switches then. And of course, it all the things alive, you know, I don't know if he had rubber gloves on or what, but. Must have been a hell of a dodgy operation, you know, but evidently he worked on with his inventive mind and got it to this stage. It's interesting that a great industrialist like Armstrong, who was responsible for many major technological advances, chose this very traditional old English style of building for a house that he filled with modern inventions. Cragside was built to last, but what about the housing for people who worked in factories like Armstrong's? The coming of the railways meant that a standard range of building materials became readily available for low-cost workers' housing all around the country. But it's difficult to get an impression of what it was really like to live in them, because those that haven't been pulled down have all been modernised. To get some sense of what it was like, you need to come to a place like Beamish. If you want to see some houses where more ordinary people live, you know, this is the place to come. This is Beamish up in the northeast near Newcastle on Tyne. And all this lovely old town behind me has been faithfully dismantled in other parts of the northeast and brought back here and re erected in every minute detail, you know. Even though it's all brand new, in a way, you know, the building, the bricks are old and the window frames are old, but when you come here, you know, you get a lovely feeling of long ago, you know, it's quite interesting.
this fine Georgian terrace, it's called Ra Ravensworth Terrace, and it, it was taken down in, in Gateshead and brought back here and re erected. Quite a lot of rows of houses in Bolton like this. It's so sad that during the last great conflict we had, they pinched all the railings off all these lovely Georgian and Victorian garden walls and melted them all down, you know. But here, they somehow or other, if they're not reprosed, they've, they've survived, you know. Very nice indeed. And the lovely windows, Georgian windows, little panes of glass. I think, being as it is, it's raining, I think I'll go in and see how Miss Smith's pianoforte lessons are going. You know, I'm off, I'll see you later. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Rather a splendid parlour you've got here, eh? It's very nice. Yeah, it's like a bit of a cut above the others, isn't it? With the semicircular arches and the... Mm. I've got a fireplace like that at home in one of my bedrooms. Yeah, it's about 1850, I would think, that that thing were made. Uh, and all, and the lovely sash windows with the panelling and uh, the shutters and everything. Like, not very long later on, you know, the... the they made rooms similar in proportion, but they, they like the Cornish moulding and the and even skirting boards at turn of the century in, in like rough worker type houses, you know, this is quite posh. Next door to the music teacher is the dentist house, and he must have been a bit well to do because he could afford a servant. Ah, good morning. This is a bit, bit like old good from old for me, this. Like, really, the, the Victorian cast iron fire grates is like the, the centre of the household. You know, everything happened here. The bread were baked and all the boiling water come out and it dried all the clothes on the rail here. From like about 1900 onwards, if you didn't have a lot of money the, the, and, and you buy a tourist house, you know, like the type in Coronation Street, the, the room, bedrooms were barren, just a square box. And the only form of lighting were one single gas bracket, nearly always screwed to the corner of the chimney breast. Or quite often, I never worked this out, at the side of a window frame. Don't know why, you know, side of where all the light does come in, you know, the, the gas bracket with them. Just like down in town here at Beamish, they've created a, a complete pit village, complete with the winding engine and engine house, the headgear, the screens, the village school, and a beautiful row of pit men's cottages. And of course, behind me, the Methodist chapel, that means no drinking, you know. <laughs> No time for slacking on BBC Two. Alan Titchmarsh is on the trail of the fastest creature on the planet. Can he catch up in Nature of Britain next this morning?